Consider your sexuality. Now think about your workplace. What's okay to talk about and what's not? How about with your family? Who do you trust to talk about sex with? And your most intimate relationships? Are there things you're still hiding? As a sex and relationship coach, I've had thousands of conversations with people about their love life. And no matter what they're working on, whether it's you know, orgasm, self-pleasure, or perhaps uh, getting comfortable with their aging body, underneath what they're really seeking is love and belonging. Unfortunately, these private conversations can sometimes cause separation, more shame, and suffering. In my opinion, these aren't individual issues. These are actually social issues. But we've lost our sense of tribe, and there are no safe social structures to be brainstorming the solutions in. So this is why I've spent the last 20 years studying community. And not just the sex-positive communities like Tantra, Kink, Polyamory, BDSM, the queer communities, but I've also been traveling the world looking at eco-villages and sustainable, utopic models of societies and yoga ashrams. And I'm not just looking at what works. I'm curious about what doesn't work, like why these, these communities break down and fall apart. Invariably, it's personality conflicts, like individual and, and um, kind of interpersonal issues. So who's sleeping with whom? Who's jealous of whom? Can we really trust each other? When we're in community and all parts of ourselves, including our sexuality, aren't warmly accepted, then we, path we kind of fracture and we pathologize, which leads to violence in our culture. So my message today is how talking about your love life can actually lead to a social revolution. Transparency builds community. And I'm going to be as bold as to say that transparent communities are essential to the evolution of humanity as a new nonviolent social structure. So I'm going to take you on a little journey. And it's going to be bold and brief. I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself, some hidden truths about humanity, um, and then I'm going to ask you to take a risk and reveal something about yourself. See, what we're going for is a sense, like a felt sense of transparent community. When I first told my friends that I was going to do a reality show about my love life, I got a lot of concerned comments. <laughs> Be careful what you reveal because it might come back and bite you in the ass later. You can do whatever you want in bed as long as it's behind closed doors. Or talking too much about your sex life is social suicide. But I still felt called to share that my husband and I are passionately in love. And we've been this way for 15 years. Yet we've dropped the social expectation of exclusivity. The way we maintain uh, intimacy is by sharing everything. So we talk about our attractions, about our other relationships, and sometimes we even share lovers. On one such occasion, we both fell in love with another couple who was also in an open marriage. And we invited them to move in with us, which was a huge risk because I was a new mother. We had like a four-year-old son, and there's very few models for what social, you know, new paradigms of family can look like. And I wanted it to be sustainable. And if the stakes weren't high enough, we invited a Hollywood camera crew <laughs> to document the entire experiment. And we let them follow us into the bedroom and show us having sex. The show's called Polyamory Married and Dating, and it aired for two seasons on Showtime. But for the record, I didn't do it for fame or for fortune. I did it for social change. My message wasn't even about alternatives to monogamy 
or coming out of the closet as a bisexual woman. My message was about coming out as a sexual being. See, sexuality is so core to what it means to be human. It's why we're all here. We're all doing it, hopefully. If not, we're all thinking about it. But why aren't we talking about it? The other side of the coin uh, of transparency, of course, is privacy. Now, privacy is very important. It's considered a cornerstone of um, our culture. So privacy <laughs> is important because if our personal information gets out, we might lose our jobs, and in some cases, custody of our children, and in extreme cases, get in trouble with the law. Privacy is what big social institutions are based on, like schools and, and churches and, of course, um, co corporate culture. They govern what we can say and when and what we can wear. And, and you know, state governs who we can marry. Like these private, the private um, kind of uh, cultural construct is rarely questioned. So, you know, I did some deep soul searching on what privacy is. And at, at root, it actually enables choice. So when we choose who we can share ourselves intimate with and who not to, it's actually a gift, a gift of ourselves. But when the default is privacy and we don't have the choice to actually share ourselves, um, then, then we shut down in shame. And in my experience, most people are just operating as if privacy is the default and you know, it, it's rooted in shame. Because we as social animals are hardwired for love and acceptance and we're terrified of losing it. It's one of our basic human needs. So we're all pretty familiar with Maslow's hierarchy and if you're watching a TED talk or in this room, likely you're striving for self-realization. You know, you're usually looking for how can I make a contribution? And let's assume most of your basic needs like food, shelter, water are handled. But oftentimes, we're bypassing our social needs for love and belongingness or relegating it to one person and a small group of best friends. If we want a society that is thriving in this upper level of consciousness, then according to Maslow, we can reach that to the degree that our lower needs are met. So as a culture, we want to rebuild community and really nourish ourselves with love and belongingness. But we also know that in order to get love and belongingness, ironically, we have to risk losing it. We have to reveal ourselves. Do you remember the book, uh, Road Less Traveled? It was a best-selling book by M. Scott Peck. You may or may not know he was originally raised Quaker, and that started his early study of community. And to date, he has the best model, developmental model of community that I've come across. So I'm going to share it with you. But his fundamental teaching is that without risk, there can be no vulnerability. Without vulnerability, there can be no community. Without community, no peace and no life. And so he had identified four progressive uh, and predictable phases that a community goes through. And I'm going to take you through them, starting with pseudo-community. We're all pretty familiar with this kind of feeling of everybody's happy, highly functioning, but there's no real risk being taken here. No intimacy. And if somebody actually comes out about their individuality, then the community moves into chaos. And here's where if somebody says something and it's unpopular, then, then somebody's trying to conform, may help them conform, and then they're trying to defend themselves and um, their struggle. And now we're starting to question the leadership. We've all been in communities in chaos. <laughs> but if the community stays together, we can actually move into emptiness. Now, this is where 
our disillusionment gets expressed. And we drop the defenses and we can share our brokenness and our failures and our fears and all the shadow of what it means to be human. And only then can we move into true community. Because this is where we cry not just out of grief, but also out of joy. And we celebrate the ups and downs of life and true healing can happen. Now I share with you this model um, so that we can, mm, I guess, embody it a little bit and do a little thought experiment in community right now. That you probably have a sense of like-mindedness, like you're in this great room and we've come together um, to make the world a better place, but instead of feeling the safety and the security of how similar we all are, I invite us to welcome in our differences, especially around sexuality. And instead of judgment, replace it with curiosity. So as I said, to build community, you'd have to take risk. So just imagine for a moment that you were to share something about your sexuality with the person behind you. Maybe there's something you know, that's a little bit edgy. And naturally, as you shared that with that person, they would reciprocate with something about their sexuality. Perhaps they're scared that they've had a recent dip in their sex drive. And the person next to you responds to your share with more like approval, validation, acceptance. They're not recoiling in horror. They're instead saying, hey, I could really use a hug because I'm going through a divorce due to infidelity. And what we find when we talk about sex is that it can also be really, really fun. <laughs> the person next to you might be like, let's brainstorm ways to pleasure our partners. Or somebody may have had a mystical experience while making love and can't wait to share it. See, when we talk about sex, it's not just about sex. It's about our heart and pleasure and love. I mean, it's, it's really about what it means to be human. And so this is a, a beautiful thought experiment, but the research actually shows, and there's lots of data to prove, that sexually open cultures are less violent and that sexually repressed cultures have the most sexual abuse. And so <clears throat> I fortunately get to see this as I travel. Um, when I work with the International School of Temple Arts and we create week-long temporary communities where we get to work through our sexual shame, and as I'm traveling the world, I like to go to permanent communities. And on one a trip to Europe, my husband and I found ourselves in southern Portugal on a 330-acre desert land with 170 full-time residents. So this is a picture of a ceremony they had on the hill. And what was exceptional about this community it's a peace research center, is that they built dams and reclaimed the water. So it's now a thriving oasis. And on this land is where I met Dieter Doom. So this is, this is a beautiful man who for 40 years has asked the question, what happens when you get a committed group of individuals together with the sole intention of creating a nonviolent society? And he <clears throat> and his partner, Sabine Lichtenfeld, love the Earth so much that when he heard about NASA, Elon Musk, and other private entrepreneurs who are making plans to colonize Mars, he thought, we're going to send billions of dollars exporting it to another planet and we're just gonna export the same consciousness that devastated our home planet. So what they decided to do was raise the consciousness on, in, um, in their Peace Research Center. And in the center of their project, so they have you know, peace outreach and ecological efforts and 
it's a very um, comprehensive view of, of a new model, but at the center, they put a love school because that's where they would work on the interpersonal issues and to really truly create transparent communities. Now, I know that it's not practical for you to drop what you're doing and move to Portugal, <laughs> and I would never ask you to do a reality show about your love life, but what I am asking is for you to consider your love life, consider your community, and what's a risk that you'd be willing to take? Even in your own sphere of influence, and if you're not comfortable taking a risk, how can you make it more uh, comfortable to give other people permission to talk about their sex life? Now I'm gonna leave you with a final story. <clears throat> I was at a polyamory potluck, and a woman came up to me and she said, thank you. I said, for what? She said, I came out to my dad that I had two boyfriends. And he was so embarrassed and ashamed that he cut me off for two years. I haven't spoken with him. Until one night he was off traveling late at a hotel room and he was you know, checking the channels and he happened upon your show. And then he called me up crying. I'm so sorry. I didn't know there were other people like you. I want you back in my life. So we never know how telling our stories is going to affect other people. That's part of the mystery of how a social revolution works. But we do know that uh, coming out of the closet is not just for gay people anymore. <laughs> And I hope that actually dropping our defenses and being more vulnerable liberates you and gets you more uh, love and belongingness. And we do know that that's just the kind of radical act that's going to make a nonviolent future.